The construction of complex molecular architectures is one of the most important applications of organic chemistry because those complex structures that we get out of the synthesis process can be used for a huge variety of applications. In this series of videos, we're going to talk about the conceptual process of designing the synthesis of a complex organic molecule. And I'm going to talk a lot in this series of videos in general terms because I really want to imbue you here with the conceptual tools, the analytical tools you can use to work with synthesis no matter what your toolbox of reactions look looks like. So of course, there's a huge variety of organic reactions out there, right? And if you are an organic chemist, you'll continue to learn new reactions really throughout your career. Because of the enormity of that information, we need a way to really think about it and process it in a highly general way. And the concepts and skills that we'll develop in this series of videos are really aimed at building that general conceptual toolbox for dealing with any set of synthetic reactions and thinking about the synthesis of really any target in general terms. So for example, we'll look at the process of thinking backwards, which in a synthetic context is called retro synthesis, working backwards from a target structure, say something like this that's relatively complicated or complex, to simpler starting materials, something like this. And we'll learn how to depict that process, the idea that this molecule can be made from these starting materials, and how to think about it conceptually and some terms associated with retrosynthesis. And then we'll talk about translating a retrosynthesis into a synthetic scheme. And at that point, we tend to get a little more in the weeds as we think about specific reagents to use, whether functional group compatibility is an issue, whether our synthesis will work as advertised, and things like this. Now briefly, let's talk about why the synthesis of organic molecules is so important. The fact that carbon can form four bonds and it forms a large number of bonds with, with other elements in the periodic table leads to an amazing structural diversity in organic compounds. And that translates into a wide variety of functionality, a wide variety of applications in medicine, agriculture, consumer products, electronics, all kinds of things. And on this slide, I've provided three examples of organic compounds that are very important in the modern world that would be impossible without man-made syntheses human design syntheses. So the first is this polymer here consisting of these thiophene repeating units. This is a polymer called P-dot, and it's used in organic substrates meant to mimic semiconducting silicon, organic semiconductors. P-dot allows semiconductors to go places where silicon couldn't possibly go, for example, in applications where the semiconductor needs to be flexible. The structure in the bottom left here is called triclosan, and you can probably find this compound in ingredients lists on the consumer products around your home. It's a broad spectrum antibiotic used in things like hand soap, shampoo, things like this. And finally, the structure on the right is glyphosate, and this is a key component of the weed killer Roundup. Without organic synthesis, none of these structures would be possible because none of them occur naturally. And certainly none of them occur naturally in amounts that we need in the modern world to actually make use of their functionalities at the scale we need. So there's a big motivation for organic synthesis. And of course, the molecules of biochemistry, things like polysaccharides, proteins, and nucleic acids are organic molecules. And so to study biochemistry or interrupt or modify biochemistry as we may need, organic synthesis is important to create analogs of these key biomolecules. From 10,000 feet, the process of organic synthesis in essence involves starting from simple, accessible starting materials, things that we can get out of, for example, petroleum or biomass, converting those through chemical reactions into complex functional materials that have a very specific function based on their complex structure. To give you a sense of what complex means, I wanted to show you some molecules from Chemistry by Design, which is a, a database of synthetic schemes for a, a huge variety of organic compounds. As you can see, there are over 2,000 compounds on this website. The final targets are all relatively complex, and this tends to mean a few things. We'll notice a few patterns if we look at the final products. Many of them are cyclic, and many of them contain ring structures that are rather unconventional. For example, odd ring sizes like eight-membered rings or bicyclic or tricyclic structures. We see a lot of stereocenters, a lot of well-defined stereocenters with wedged or dashed groups. And we might see 
some functional groups or some connectivity patterns that we're not used to seeing in simpler compounds, like an oxygen, for example, one carbon away from a double bond, or a carbonyl group, one carbon away from a carbon-carbon double bond. In fact, nearly all of these compounds contain more than one functional group, and it's the interplay between the functional groups and their relative positions that give a lot of these compounds their functionality. Where do we get the materials, the simple starting materials that are really the building blocks of organic synthesis? Well, if you're a practicing chemist, you often buy them from places like Sigma Aldrich or Acros, Alpha Azer, any chemical company, right? But where do they get their starting materials? There are basically two sources of starting materials for organic synthesis. The major source is non-renewable feedstocks from things like petroleum, coal, and natural gas, fossil fuels. Naturally, this is a huge long-term problem, right? Because this feedstock will eventually run out. You can see under the heading a number of compounds that come from fossil fuels, things like simple alkenes, simple alkynes, simple aromatic compounds like benzene and small substituted benzenes like phenol and toluene, and a few polycyclic aromatic compounds like naphthalene. We also get some cyclic hydrocarbons out of this, like cyclohexane, and some nitrogen-containing heterocycles like pyridine. Biomass and byproducts of biomass that we can get through high temperatures and, and acid treatment and things like this are a renewable source of simple starting materials. And these compounds are some that we can get from renewables. Things like methane, ethanol and methanol, simple alcohols, glycerol, yet another alcohol. Here we see a lot of oxygens, right? Because life tends to have a lot of molecules containing oxygen since carbohydrates are a big basis of the um, energy storage of life. So a very different looking set of molecules, a lot more highly oxidized, much fewer aromatics, generally fewer double and triple bonds and, and more single bonds. So that's gonna introduce some challenges for organic synthesis moving forward. But this just goes to show you that it's a field that's still maturing really, even now as we move from the old to the new, we're going to see new types of reactions coming in, different types of reactions growing in popularity and new types of synthetic roots becoming more normal as we have to move away from fossil fuels.